hello. So you're joining me at the beginning of a journey whose destination I am not totally clear what it is, but I thought I would vlog this because I've just been in the mood to vlog recently, and I also thought this might be an interesting project for us to embark on together, which is context here. My reading taste, I feel like, has changed a lot over the last decade of my life. So from like my early 20s to my early 30s. Yes, I'm turning 35 soon, but shh, let's not talk about that when I'm firmly in my mid 30s, but my early 20s to my early 30s. I feel like my reading taste changed a lot. And a lot of that is correlated to like major changes in my life to changes in my beliefs that drove kind of some of the things that I was and wasn't picking up and why. But one of the things that definitely changed, I feel like in the last decade of my life is that I used to really seek out and be up on contemporary literary fiction releases, interested in the Donna Tarts of the world or the Zadie Smiths. The, a lot of the things that were on my radar were definitely more driven towards kind of like upmarket fiction or literary fiction or like book club fiction. And when I say contemporary, I just mean in terms of like released recently as opposed to like a classic. So that also encompassed historical fiction. So, you know, old what's her face who wrote The Girl with the Pearl Earring. I got really into all of her books for a while or whatever like the latest buzzy book club pick was. That was a lot of what I read at that point in my life. However, as time has gone on, I am interested in and pick up less and less of that. I also wonder if it's a function of sort of like what reviewing content I tend to consume. I used to read a lot of blogs and listen to a lot of podcasts that were very focused on frontless literary or upmarket fiction releases. And that has just like changed a lot. I feel like over the last decade, I consume obviously a lot more booktube, book talk in the last couple of years as well. Uh, and a lot of the blogs and stuff that I read are more focused on kind of like genre fiction stuff. Basically, I just don't have on my radar as much literary fiction. So so I did, however, see this cross the transom of my awareness, which is the newest release from Hanya Yanagihara, who is the author of A Little Life. And A Little Life, I know, has been pretty buzzy on online bookish spaces that I frequent in the last couple of years. So I don't think that this is unfamiliar territory for those of you who are consumers of BookTube or BookTok. But I, this was the first kind of frontlist, buzzy literary release that I have been interested in in a long time. So I thought maybe what we could do is I could vlog my experience of reading this, think through like my reaction to this book in particular, and I may pick up a couple of other literary or upmarket fiction picks that I picked up a long time ago or got onto my TBR a long time ago and I've still not read them. I don't know, like uh, some of the Patrick Melrose novels or there's a couple of short story collections I have on my TBR. And I thought maybe we could just experience together if and why my taste has changed, what does and doesn't work for me about some of these books. And and uh, I hope to emerge from this a more self-aware reader in terms of my preferences for this specific area of sort of, I guess, like general fiction that doesn't have like a specific genre, since so much of the fiction that I read is pretty genre based at this point. Or classics, that's the other thing. I think a lot of the space I used to give to these kind of books, now I would give to a classic. So all that to say, no idea how this project is going to go, but you will find out as I find out. I just realized I never actually told you guys what To Paradise is about. I thought maybe we could do that. I'm just about done with my current read, which is Guns of the Dawn, which is good but not as good as I was hoping. To Paradise. I thought I would read you the description so you could see what intrigued me. Also, we've got a fun ye fantasy map in here. So that's exciting. From the author of the classic A Little Life, a bold, brilliant novel spanning three centuries and three different versions of the American experiment about lovers, family, loss, and the elusive promise of utopia. In an alternative version of 1893 America, New York is part of the free states where people may live and love whomever they please, or so it seems. The fragile young scion of a distinguished family resists betrothal to a worthy suitor, drawn to a charming music teacher, 
of no means. In 1993, Manhattan besieged by the AIDS epidemic, a young Hawaiian man lives with his much older, wealthier partner, hiding his troubled childhood and the fate of his father. And in 2093, in a world riven by plagues and governed by totalitarian rule, a powerful scientist's damaged granddaughter tries to navigate life without him and solve the mystery of her husband's disappearance. These three sections are joined in an enthralling and ingenious symphony as recurring notes and themes deep to enrich one another, yada, yada, yada. What unites not just the characters, but these Americas are their reckonings with the qualities that make us human. Fear, love, shame, need, loneliness. Two Paradises is a fin de siècle novel of mar marvelous literary effect, but above all, it is a work of emotional genius. So basically literary speculative fiction. I do tend to really like speculative retellings of history. So a steampunk kind of vibe tends to work pretty well for me. So that plus literariness in the past would have been utter catnip for me and this did appeal to me so that's why I got it and that's why we're even doing this project so that's what the book is about I will get started on it I don't know if I'll get started on it today but probably tomorrow so yeah Okay, I thought I would check in because I am about 50 pages in, so really just getting going to give you my initial impressions. So I would say so far this is good, but not great. I think I read you guys the synopsis. So I think there's gonna be three different stories and I wasn't sure at first that they were like interwoven. So it's in 1893, 1993 and 2093. And I thought that maybe it would be like different chapters jumping around in time. I don't think that's what's gonna Gonna happen. I think it's basically three parts and the and it goes forward through time. So right now we are in book one, which is Washington Square. Book two is Lipo Wow Nahili, and book three is Zone Eight. So oh okay, I just noticed. Interesting, because this is like a 700 page book and it looks like books one and two are half and then book three is the last half. So that's interesting. Okay, so anyway, what we know so far is our point of view character is David Bingham and he is the grandson of this like very, very prestigious family in New York. I'm thinking kind of maybe like the Rockefeller or something like that. He is sort of like the heir of the family. At the beginning of the story, his grandfather sits him, his brother and his sister down and essentially tells them how he's gonna divide his estate up. And the implication is David is getting the best slice. So that means he's sort of like the next head of the family. And what's interesting is that, so I was, I think I showed you guys, there's like a map here. In this version of the US, it's like chunked up into a bunch of different countries that are all like contiguous. And then we have the Kingdom of Hawaii out here. And so in New York, this is the free states. And one of the things that the free states allows is marriage with whoever. So David is gay and his grandfather is trying to arrange for him a marriage with another notable family and it's to a man. So they're talking about having an arranged marriage between him and this guy named Charles. So I think that's interesting. And I think also what's interesting is that we still have racism. So we still have, he overhears this debate about whether black people are actually fully human. And like, yeah, we let them pass through on their way to Canada or to somewhere else, but we don't really want them here. So like, I think that's an interesting tension of there's this freedom of sexual expression, but like intrinsic full personhood for everyone is still not a thing, even in this like idealized quote unquote version of the past. So, you know, that's always an interesting tension of like, just because you're progressive or whatever word you wanna use in one area doesn't mean you are in another. So yeah, I guess that's kind of my impression so far. I think the writing is nice, but not amazing. I know everybody, like a little life of apparently slayed everybody's heart. So I'm wondering if that's what's gonna happen. I will say that he's courting Charles, but then he's also, it seems like getting something going with this penniless music teacher named Edward. So I'm wondering if this is gonna be sort of like an Edith Wharton type story where the hoi polloi of New York society, rich versus poor, following your heart versus following the dictates of your social position. We'll see. So anyway, those are my impressions so far. I'll check back in once I get through at least this book and maybe make some progress in the next one.
So I've spent all day so far. Well, I took a break to talk to my friend Kim, who you guys know, she was on my AITA video, you know Kim, she's great. So we took a pause to talk to her, but uh, I have been diligently working away on this book and I am now halfway through and I have read the first book and the second book. So first book, 1893, alternative history of the US, very Wharton-esque. I liked it pretty well. I liked it pretty well. It, it, it's an interesting commentary on, I think I was talking about this when I last checked in with you guys, on the limitations of freedom. Even if you give one marginalized group freedom, does that really, how does that impact society as a whole? Because we have freedom for members of the LGBTQIA plus community in this alternative history in this specific part of the US, but they don't have those same freedoms elsewhere in this version of the US. Like they don't have it for most of it. They really only have it in this like one little area, but then they're also still like hella racist against both black and indigenous people are still super fucking classist. Like the whole conflict is because David wants to marry Edward, but he should marry Charles. And it's this arranged marriage situation from his granddad. So like, it's still very classist and elitist. So I think it's an interesting, yeah, I mean, it was an interesting idea. I don't know that it was like beautifully written. I don't know that the characters were super memorable. So it was good. I would give it like a B plus. So let's call that like a three and a half. Then we get to the second section, which is called, oh gosh, let's let's refresh my memory here. Lipo Wayo Nahila. And it is set in 1993, in what I think is meant to be our timeline again, pretty much, as things actually exist or happen, we basically get, I don't know, I don't, I don't know that I loved this book. We have, okay, well, what is interesting? I will say this. We have basically the same characters, same names, or, well, how to say this? They're not the same characters, but they are iterations of the character. So, like, we have a David again, except that he is a Hawaiian paralegal, but he's living in New York, and he's trying to, he's like having an affair with his attorney employer Charles. So we have David and Charles again. And then we also have a complicated like family relationship again, because in the first one, it was really with Nathaniel, who is the granddad of the Binghams and David, who's the grandson and like heir apparent. This time we have David and his dad, Wika, I think that's his dad's name. Yeah, Wika, because David's real, like his Hawaiian name is Kawika. And Wika is his dad and he's dying. And so there's like this complicated father-son relationship there. There's also kind of like layers around Wika is the son of the, like the queen who ceded to American rule. So he's got this sort of like, uh, there's a big theme, I guess, of Hawaiian colonialism in this. I don't know that this all came together for me, the second book. I didn't like it as much as the first one. Here you go. You can see this is the map. I will say something I like in this book design is that the maps are on the end pages, so it's very easy to find them if you have questions. But anyway, so this is the second map. The third map is the book that we are about to start, and it is called Zone 8. Oh, oh okay, and it's got a bunch of parts, so I hadn't noticed that. So yeah, that's the back half of this book. I'm pretty ambivalent about this book right now. I would, like I said, I probably would have given that first book set in 1893, like a three and a half. I liked it pretty well. I probably would have given the 1993 section like a two and a half. It seems pretty boring and conventional. I don't know. It, I, I'm not seeing yet the love for this author. I'm not in love yet. And it's an awful long book. It's 700 pages. And for me to at this point be at a three star is kind of disappointing. So I'm going to keep going with it. I'll check back in. I have Hastings here with me in bed, we are snuggling. And then, um, yeah, I've been reading in bed, snuggling with the kitties. I talked to Kim, it's snowing now. This is our third week in a row of snow. So that's thrilling for the South United States. Like that's pretty unusual. So um, I'm enjoying the snowy atmosphere. I'm eating some lunch, relaxing. So I think I will probably finish this today. Yeah, I'm not loving it. If we're talking about how I feel about this now versus how I would have felt about it in my early 20s, I don't know. I mean, I probably should get to the end so far. I don't know if I would have loved this. I think I would have liked it more 10 years ago. I think now I've just seen a lot of these 
themes in books more. Maybe that's also part of it is that a lot of what these kinds of books bring to the table is beautiful writing, interesting character development, profound themes. And maybe just as I age and I've read more and more, it takes more for me to be impressed by any of those things. And if that's like the main thrust of the story rather than some level of plot entertainment, maybe I just, it's harder for me to get into it. I don't know. We'll see how the last section goes. It is, I think probably the most speculative of the three because it's set in the future in some sort of like dystopia. And I think there's like some sort of plagueishness if I'm remembering rightly. So yeah, I'll check back in with you when I get through that. I am pleased with how quickly I'm getting through this book as a whole. I thought it was gonna take me longer, but it's a lot easier to read than I thought maybe it would be. I thought it might have been like more dense in its prose and therefore a little more difficult to get into. But so far I found it like readability is good. It's just not necessarily that compelling to me. Anyway, I'll check in with you guys later. Okay, um, yeah, I don't know about this. <laughs> I posted on Goodreads my status update and it was just, hmm, because yeah, hmm, I don't know. We're, we're almost done. I've got like 200 pages left. It's very depressing when I say I'm almost done and then I realize I do still have a full 200 more pages, but whatever. Ambivalent, this actually, this section is, so it's dystopian and it reminds me of that, what is it? Machines Like Me by Ian McEwan. I read that a couple of years ago for um, the Goodreads sci-fi finalist challenge I was doing. And it, it reminds me very much of that in terms of it. Okay, this is a lit fic author doing speculative and it's just kind of meh. Yeah, it feels pretty aggressively mediocre. <laughs> it's a dystopian novel, in my opinion. I will say, so I was, I told you guys that I thought it was set in 2093 and the present day is, it's like going into 2094, but it starts in 2093. It then goes back 50 years to when the whole leg pandemicness started and we were getting that in letters and I don't really like that bit. I mostly, I'm more into the things that are in the present. So I don't know. I don't know about that, but I would, I, I was trying to remember things that I like, and I remembered that I forgot to tell you guys that the end of the first two books both end where there's a line where the, the title is said, and I always find that very thrilling in a book. So the book is called To Paradise, and the end of the first book says, and I don't think either of these are spoilers, so that's why I'm reading them. So he would stand here for another moment, the bag leaden in his hand, and he then would take a breath, and then he would make his first step his first step to a new life, his first step to paradise. So that's the end of, uh, oh gosh, the dust jacket fell off. Okay. Oh, and it's not even pretty inside. That's a bummer. Okay. Then at the end of the second book, again, I don't think this is really a spoiler. It's just like the last sentence. And then I'll start walking, not to my mother's house, not to Lipo Wadnehale, but to somewhere else, the same place I hope you've gone, and I won't stop, I won't need to rest, not until I make it there, all the way to you, all the way to paradise. So the book is called To Paradise, and I, I, I don't know. We'll see how the third book ends. Aside from, like, thematically there's some ties, character naming is the same across the books in these different versions. I can't tell, I don't think it's meant to be like the Cloud Atlas, where it's like reincarnations of the same people. I think it's meant to just be thematic resonances between these characters' lives. But maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. We'll keep... Uh, I'm not done yet. I've got another 200 pages, so we'll see how I do. Right now, I'm pretty disappointed. I've invested a lot of energy into this, and it's only okay. And if you read this many pages, you want it to be more than just okay. So I don't know. Stay tuned. We 
did it, didn't we, Hastings? Yes. Watching some Jess. Um, well, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know about this, guys. This was 700 pages of just fine. I don't know. I'll sleep on it and get back with you, but preliminarily not pleased. Though I am enjoying how snuggly Hastings has been today. Yeah, you just the cutest. Okay, so we'll talk more about this and we'll talk about what I'll read next for this little experiment, but yeah, I don't know. Hey there, good morning. I am making some coffee and strapping in for what is going to be a hellacious week. <sighs> R.I.P. my sanity, R.I.P. my general well-being for the next few days, but um, while I'm making my coffee, I thought I would tell you about where I am with Two Paradise right now and what I think I might read next in this experiment. So I just realized that this thing boiling is probably not going to be great audio. Let's wait until I'm done with that. So Two Paradise. I'm pretty disappointed in this, having gotten through the whole thing. I mean, it is a chonky big boy. It's 700 pages and it's fine. It's good. There are things I like, there are things I don't like in terms of what it was trying to do. I think this has a lot to say about generational expectations and how one generation sets up life for subsequent generations, which I think in the light of like climate change, et cetera, is a very relevant theme. This also obviously has a lot of themes around love between same sex people. So I don't feel like I'm the best person to comment on how good or bad that was, but that definitely was like a major part of the exploration of this book, which I thought was interesting. There's like colonialization stuff in here, recurring themes around like Hawaii's colonization. Uh, I take it that the author is Hawaiian. So I think that that makes sense and that was interesting. This has also got a lot to say about like pandemic life and like what we give up to have safety, which I guess could be a theme like within all of the books. Like what does it mean to be safe on sort of like an interpersonal level versus like at a macro level? I think my problem is, is that I just don't think it needed to take 700 pages to do any of those things. I actually wonder if this had been published as three separate books interconnected. I don't know. I, I think having it as one book, I'm just not sure because ultimately I don't, aside from like the repeating characters and I guess maybe they're being reincarnated, maybe not. I don't know. I don't, I don't think so. I think it's just meant to be if we're, the world had gone differently at different points, what would some of these types of characters be doing? I guess. I don't know. I don't feel like all the books come together fully enough. The writing is nice and, and lovely. It's fine. I wouldn't say it's great. The character development is good, but again, I wouldn't say it's great. It's not exceptional. Nothing in this book I feel like is exceptional. I want it to be for this kind of investment in page count, which I keep coming back to, but I have a lot of grace for things that either read really quickly and so you can get through them very quickly, or if they're short, because it's like, okay, like maybe this wasn't for me, but you keep, keep it pushing and keep moving. <sighs> And this is just like, it's asking a lot of you as the reader. So I feel like it should deliver. I don't know. I will be very interested to hear from people who've read A Little Life, how they feel like this stacks up against it because I was pretty underwhelmed. I would give this a three star. It is fine. Three to me is a B. This is a B, this is fine. But I just, it didn't give me what I was hoping it would, honestly. So, okay, but this did give me clarity because some of the things that I have on my TBR already deal with a light speculative element or a light kind of like weird element, which that had. Some of them are intergenerational. And I'm also wondering if we can address the length thing by going for some short stories. So I think that the next book I'm gonna read is Dr. Olaf von Schuyler's Brain, which if you've been around the channel, you you know, if you know, you know, I have had on my TBR for 10 years now. I bought this right when like this kind of, you know, when literary fiction, contemporary literary fiction was much more my thing. And I heard about this on a podcast and it sounded really good. And so I picked it up and it's just been languishing there, but it is basically short stories in the same family over several generations. So we're getting the same idea. Like I think that there's a speculative element because I think the original Dr. Von Schuyler is sort of almost like a, like kind of a little bit of quackery. So there's sort of like a weird or speculative-ish element 
it's intergenerational, but it's short. So we'll see, like, I think that this is a good comparison point to this to help me understand if any of the elements in here aren't my favorite at this point, or if it's this book in particular, like I think this will be a good comparison. So wish me luck on this crazy day and I'll check in with you once I've read that book. really enjoying this. I'm liking this actually quite a bit better than I like To Paradise. So that's an interesting development in our experiment on if I still like contemporary literature. I don't know, man. Like, am I just... Okay, here's my befuddlement. So I was checking the reviews on To Paradise because I am very conflicted about if this is just me. It could just be a me thing. I don't know. And I saw that Ron Charles, who is like one of my favorite reviewers, definitely my favorite sort of mainstream reviewer, gave this five stars and he said, brace yourself, Yana Gahara is back with a daunting new book titled To Paradise. The emotional impact of this novel is less visceral than A Little Life, but only because the author's scope is now so vast and her dexterity so dazzling. Presented as a triptych of related novellas, To Paradise demonstrates inexhaustible ingenuity of an author who keeps shattering expectations. I just don't see that. <laughs> Am I dumb? It is possible I'm dumb. Uh, I don't know, man. I just don't, that wasn't my experience. It was fine. I don't know. Anyway, that was making me feel just dumb, but I am enjoying this more. And I flagged, let me give you an example of what I like about the prose in this. I just thought this was a great example of themes in a book that are also expressed with language that's basically is not the first thing you would go to to describe the ideas the author is trying to communicate. So she says, Olaf nodded, though he'd ceased going to church, not for want of faith. He prayed to the same God his neighbors did, but for the men who failed to have faith in him, men who watched a sick baby die and called it God's will, and who called the search for a cure devil's work. Like, that's not super flowery, but I just think that it is encapsulating an interesting idea, which is we've got this doctor in 1600s New York back when it's still New Amsterdam and we find out about his life kind of on the run and he is definitely practicing what we would now think of as quackery but like that's not how he perceives it he perceives his pursuits as being scientific in some sense and as not being to the exclusion of having religious faith so I don't know just like little moments like that I really like the way this author captures it I also really love the different quackeries over time that have been presented like in the first one there's definitely you know lots of brain cutting up and and urine experiments and then there's one about spontaneous combustion like it's got a variety of different forms of medical quackery and it's all set in New York. It ties in a little bit with To Paradise in terms of you know the kind of resonances with public health or our pursuit of science and health so I think there's some resonance there it's also I just really like the writing I like the characterization and I like the overall vibe. So what all of this made me think of is that I am enjoying this. So is it maybe that I just, I don't like novels, like contemporary literary novels, but I do still like short stories? That definitely could be. So I think for the, I'm gonna have two more books I read for this experiment. And I think one of them should be another short story collection. And I think one of them should be a novel. I'm tempted because I've read from George Saunders and Marilyn Robinson before, so I'm tempted to go with one of these, but I think my novel, ah, I almost knocked you over. That would have been really bad. Uh, I think the novel I'll go with is the first Patrick Melrose novel, frankly, because I wanna see if I like it enough to keep the book or if I'm gonna unhaul it because it's five books in one. The first one is Nevermind, like Nirvana. So I'll read the first, book of this. But my thought is, 
I've not read from either Kirsten Minger Anderson or Tanya Yanagahara, so I feel like I should also, to keep all of our variables as similar as possible, let's also go with an, an author I've not read before for the novel. And then the short story collections I could go with. If we're following that same logic, I should eliminate the Stephen Milhauser because I've read and enjoyed his short stories before, but I'll probably pick one of these two, either The World Does Not Require You or Birds of a Lesser Paradise. So yeah, that I think is how we'll round out the experiment. But all that to say, checking in, feeling mildly gaslit by Ron Charles, and uh, very much enjoying what I've read so far of this. So I feel like that's promising. Fingers crossed that continues. Hi friends. <sighs> I'm at the end of the week. I feel chewed up and spit out. It has been a brutal week at work. Side note, I guess for those of you in any kind of software development type profession. So just imagine you've been working on something for mm, a year conservatively, realistically more like 14 months, but like a year of requirements and design and revising requirements and revising design. And like all this is allegedly agile and you know, nobody ever really does agile anyway. And you finally got through four months of UAT. You're doing your final dry runs and it's not working and nobody will just admit that it's not working. So every day you're on hours long operational dry run only on the Friday afternoon before the Saturday deployment to agree that it's a no-go. Ah! It was the right decision, but it's just been so... It's been a lot. Okay, anyway, side note. For those of you not in software development, that made no sense to you. Anyway, side note. Okay, I did finish <laughs> Dr. Olaf von Schuyler's brain. I really like this. I give this four stars. Now, as was the case with most short story collections, there are highs and lows. There are things that I didn't like as much as others, but I really liked the early stories and I really liked the later stories. The last story in particular had a lot to do with father-daughter relationships at the time of the father's death, which I definitely had some resonance for me. There was also a really interesting story about this woman who marries into this family, who is um, an Eastern European Jewish immigrant to New York and her name was Devora, and she she starts to go by like, I think Dora instead, and kind of talking about the, almost like the reflecting on the experience of becoming white it, and like the whole construction of being white is such a nebulous thing because you know, all you do is change your name and socio-cultural vectors and all of a sudden you're white. Anyway, I just thought that was an interesting story. This has a, I mean, I think especially that we are in a time of like public health crisis and all of these sort of quackery type cures for COVID. I think that this had a lot of extra resonance to it. And I just really liked the writing. I thought that it was, it had moments of being a little bit more flowery or whatever, but it was always handled well. It never distracted from the story. And more than anything, the writing I thought was good because it had a lot of well-observed moments, impactful metaphors, interesting situations that were chosen and explored. Like overall, I thought that this was good. So I would give this four stars. It's been on my DBR for a very long time. So congrats to me for finally getting to it. Now, Whew. Okay, I need you all to strap in and I need to give you a very strong content warning for this book, which I remembered as I was reading it, because I had heard this before, that this first novel in the Patrick Melrose arc is about child essay. And basically my understanding is that the tra trajectory of these novels, because this is following Patrick Mel Melrose over the course of his life and how his experience with childhood essay and basically ongoing abuse from his father impacts his entire life. Like I think he deals with it addiction. He has a lot of complicated feelings about sexuality. Like this first novel in the arc is him at five experiencing that abuse. So just know that. And I, I had been told that. So it wasn't, once I got into it, I, I quickly remembered like, oh yeah, that's right. That's what this whole arc is about. So I did know that going in. I think that this book raises interesting questions about art and depictions of difficult subjects, be that different forms of essay or abuse, racism, different prejudices, prejudices, etc. Because at some point, every reader is going to have a different experience or tolerance level for what they will be put through in the name of experiencing a work of art, right? And I think that that is just idiosyncratic to everyone. And I think that there's also good art and bad art. For me, I did not think that this was good enough art 
to suffer through that subject matter. It's not terribly written, but I did feel like it was pretty, like particularly this author's use of similes, I found to be really ham-fisted. I, I didn't like the language choices, like the prose itself I didn't feel like was strong enough for me to wade through such a difficult subject. So that's gonna vary for everyone. For me, the payoff of what I learned about the human experience from this piece of art was not enough. The writing wasn't strong enough, the insights were not strong enough, and therefore I leave this book at like a two star. I could see that for someone else, maybe they would have gotten more out of it. For me, not as much. Yeah, anyway, this, may, this did just make me think about, I, I'm not somebody who thinks that these subjects can never be depicted in art. I just think that there's always gonna be your mileage may vary coming into that. For me, it's a pretty big risk reward situation. Like reading something that I find frankly pretty triggering is not quite the right word, but like very emotionally resonant and difficult, as I think anyone who's experienced any kind of essay can identify with. Experiencing that in a work of art, there has to be some real payoff for me. I also find it more easy to deal with that topic if it's not on page in a certain way. So like for instance, The Mad Ship, that's a recent five-star read for me that definitely does feature S.A as a strong theme in some of the plot lines. Particularly, I'm thinking of how that's handled with Cirilla. And what happens in that one is that you have everything up to the event. You have the character reflecting on the fact that something happened, but you're not with her in the moment. And it really is about you experiencing her emotions rather than the act. And I think where that character is going, how it is contextualized in the overall story for me makes it not gratuitous or sort of like trauma porn. It feels like it is an integral part of that character's journey. She's not the only female character. That's another pet peeve I have is when SA is like the only bad thing that can happen to female characters in a world. Lots of bad things are happening to <laughs> Lots of people in that story, including SA for different characters, but also lots of other horrible things. So it's not, it doesn't feel like, ooh, like this is just the worst thing that can happen to a woman. Like there's a very specific build up to it. So in that case, that was something that, it's not that I enjoyed reading it, but in the context of the overall artistic vision, it made sense to me. I could get on board with it being there. But in the case of this, I just couldn't get there and there wasn't enough other things happening to make up for that. So. The good news is I'm not gonna continue this series so I can unhaul this book, which was a nice chonky one. And this is a book that I have been meaning to read for more than 10 years. Like this has been on my TBR or on my radar for a very long time. So I'm excited or glad that I finally did read it, but I didn't like it. And I don't know, I wonder if 10 years ago, Mara would have had more tolerance or been more in a place to enjoy that. You know, something else that I'm thinking about is that, I mean, you know, I started this by talking about what a terrible week at work it was. You know, at the end of one of the days I read Love on the Brain, which is the next Allie Hazelwood release after the love hypothesis. And it was so what I needed. I just loved it. it. It's not a perfect, if you didn't like the love hypothesis, you will not like this book, but it just, it hit the spot for me. I just really loved it. It was what I needed. And that's another thing that has changed in the 10 years is, you know, when you work full time or when you're watching kids full time, like you're just in a different place than when you first get out of college. You have different mental energy, or I guess sort of just mental reserves to get through things or not get through things. So I don't know. I mean, I guess that's probably a part of it too too is just maybe 10 years ago when I was still young and fresh faced and life hadn't worn me down. <laughs> maybe I just had more excitement or energy for grimmer things in a book. Like maybe I just had more patience or need or interest in that. And now it's just like, oh yeah, yeah, I'm in the middle of a th season three of a pandemic. I, you know, look around at the state of my country and the state of the world. And I also spend all day in a very high octane job. Job. Like I just want to, I just want to come home and 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 feel good. Like I just want to feel good at the end of the day, and this did not make me feel good. So I wonder also, in terms of the overall experiment of this, if that is a good insight for me. Is just I don't have the same capacity for that kind of literature that I used to. Maybe I don't know. So our last book in this experiment is going to be Birds of a Lesser Paradise by Megan Mayhew Bergman. I have never read something from this author before. It is another short story collection. So let's see. How I do with this, this will be, I think, a good concluding data point because, you know, if I hate it, I don't know what that will say, but if I like it, maybe this just means short stories are more my thing now in literary fiction. Who knows? Stay tuned for our last data point to be completed. So um, I filmed today. I hung out with one of my friends and we caught 
got up and had coffee and vented about life. So that was good. So it's been a full day and I settled in before dinner to make some progress on Birds of a Lesser Paradise. I've read four stories, so I'm, I'm a good chunk of the way through this already. It's I. It's okay. I wouldn't say that this is one that I'm particularly connecting with. The writing is fine. I, <laughs> I don't know. I'm, I'm not gonna finish this tonight because I could, but I feel like I'm not in the right mood. I wanna try reading it tomorrow when I'm in a different mood to see if it's just a me thing or if this really is just so-so. It's fine. Um, all of the stories thematically have to do with animals of some kind, so that's sort of like a uniting theme in the collection. And then what... I, what did the blurb say? Exploring the way our choices and relationships are shaped by the menace and beauty of the natural world. She captures the surprising moments when the pull of our biology becomes evident, when love or fear collide with good sense, and when our attachment to an animal or wild place cannot be denied. So that's the theme. Yeah, I, I mean, I guess that checks out. I think the writing, I like the writing style, which is that it's more well-observed than like flowery or overly beautiful. Or for instance, when we were reading the Edward St. Alban, the Patrick Melrose novel, where it's so overloaded with similes that it just is like, this is a lot. <laughs> I should, let me, I'll grab that in a second and read you an example. I don't think I gave you an example of that, but this one is more just like simple and direct. So I like that, but I don't know that this is anything too special or memorable. So we'll try again tomorrow and see how I feel about it. And I think I will be done with this tomorrow. So then we can just wrap the whole thing up and talk about what I've learned. I do think I have some good data coming out of this project. <laughs> so we can talk about that, but let me grab... Patrick Melrose real quick. Okay, let's see here. Okay, yeah, this this is where I was, this is the first time it jarred me. So this is describing his mom, um, kind of like talking about her getting ready in the morning. Uh, with each step, she pushed her hands against her knees to help her forward, staring down through huge dark glasses at the white canvas shoes on her pale feet, her dark pink raw silk trousers, like hot peppers clinging to her legs. Okay, she imagined, and this is the next sentence, she imagined vodka poured over ice and all the cubes that had been frosted over turning clear and collapsing in the grass and ice crackling like a spine in the hands of a confident osteopath. All the sticky, awkward cubes of ice floating together, tinkling their frost thrown off to the side of the glass and the vodka cold and unctuous in her mouth. That's just, for me, that's a little bit of overwriting. So in contrast, I would say that this is much more kind of like spare prose, which tends to be more my vibe. That was also true of To Paradise, like the actual writing quality I liked in that one pretty well. So yeah, anyway, let's check in again tomorrow. I'll give you my final thoughts and we can wrap this interesting little experiment up. Okay, pals, did go ahead and finish up Birds of a Lesser Paradise. And what did I think? I didn't really think anything. <laughs> I don't know. Again, maybe I just have not been in the right mood for this, but I, this, does is ugh. this is just so fine the writing is nice you know it has some things to say i guess about animals and humans and the relationship thereof and i don't know i mean like i'm literally sitting here trying to think about what the most memorable story was and i think my answer is none so i don't really know how to rate this because it is fine i mean so like i guess it's a three star but i kind of want to give it a two and a half if i literally can't i finished it this morning and if i still don't really think anything stands out that doesn't say anything good about it right I don't know I don't know okay I feel bad I was hoping I was gonna end this on like a positive note but unfortunately that was not to be so what did we learn from our little experiment here this is definitely the the order I would rank these in and I think one thing I've learned is that I want to be entertained in a way that maybe wasn't as much of a premium when I was younger by books. I think also when I was younger, I, I watched a lot more TV and movies. So books had more space maybe to not be my source of entertainment. But at this point in my life, the vast majority of my entertainment comes from books. And so that's more of a premium for me. And when you think about like classic literature, you know, that's my big old collection of it back here. It is usually entertaining, even if it has like more flowery language or has like a higher kind of artistic aim to it. It also was aiming to entertain often in a way that modern contemporary literary fiction doesn't. So like Charles Dickens, for instance, we think of him as a classic, 
But he was also like the the Stephen King basically of his day, like the non scary version of Stephen King. He was wildly popular. His books were highly sought out by everyone, not just you know the hoity toity elites or you know the intelligentsia of the Victorian era. And I just think that the aim of this kind of literature in general is different than classics. I just don't think it's so much my taste anymore, which is just interesting as a note on my own evolution. So I would say the biggest disappointment is To Paradise just because it's so long. I am struggling even like a week and a half out from having read it to remember a whole lot about it, which doesn't say anything good. It was good, it was fine, it was competent, the writing was nice, it was more entertaining than these two, I thought. So like, I think that this was more enjoyable, but if it's gonna be such a chonky book, you hope that it leaves more of an impression than it did. I will say the victory of this experiment was definitely Dr. Olaf von Schuyler's brain because I've been meaning to read this for years. I checked and I first bought this in 2011. So this has been on my TBR for almost 11 years physically beyond the fact that I wanted to read it beforehand because it came out in 2008. So I'm glad I finally read this because I did enjoy this. Like this was both entertaining but also very thought provoking. I liked the writing quality. Like this, this is what, this is what I'm into I think at this point is literary fiction that also has some level of enjoyment or entertainment to it. I for instance find that with Roxane Gay's short story. And I think maybe my takeaway is that I should just stick to short stories and contemporary literary fiction because even if they don't end up being my favorite, I'm not as disappointed and it's less of a time investment or like an emotional investment because if I'm not liking a story, I can just skip it and go to the next. So I think maybe that's kind of my takeaway because this has been on my TBR for probably 15 years. I finally bought it almost four years ago and now that I actually read it, it's just like way not my thing. Maybe I would see, maybe I would enjoy the adaptation with Benedict Cumberbatch in it, possibly. Maybe that would be more to my liking since now books and movies slash TV has sort of flipped for me where I have more space for TV and movies to not necessarily be entertaining as their primary value. I have more space for sort of more artistic film versus just movies. So possibly this could work better for me as the five part limited event series on Showtime. Maybe that would work better for me. So I think, yeah, take away, this was the biggest hit. This was the biggest disappointment. This is what I like the least and this was the least memorable. So I, I don't know where that leaves me, but this one is staying in my collection, the rest are going. <sighs> I would be interested particularly on this one to hear from people who've read both this and A Little Life to talk about how they compare because I have not read A Little Life. It seemed like it was too much trauma porn for me and so I just don't want to read that. But if you've read both, I would definitely be interested to hear your perspective. And yeah, I don't know. You guys let me know what you thought about this experiment. I am glad I did this. I feel like it was a good sort of check-in with how my reading taste has evolved. And it was also just good to kind of get a few books that have been on my TBR for a very long time off of it. So let me know if you'd be interested in seeing me do a round two of this, maybe with authors that I've read already before. So I already know that in theory, I like their stuff. Or if you want me to do some short story collection reading to narrow in on that, I don't know. Let me know in the comments below if any of that's interesting or what you thought of this experiment in general. And yeah, I think that that will do it for me. So if you enjoyed this video, please like, subscribe, follow me on the social medias if you are so inclined. I have all that information listed in the description box below. And I think that that will do it. I hope you're having an absolutely lovely day today and I will just talk to you soon. Bye.